start with the interventions before the disease actually occurs. And why we believe it is possible to do so is because we can actually see the changes in glycans in humans even up to 10 years before the symptoms of the disease. Now in humans, it's not as simple as it is in mice. You cannot just supplement them with a precursor and cure a disease. So there might be some influence of the genetic background. Uh, there is still a lot that we don't understand, but we, what we want to build upon and what we really do want to develop is um, early biomarkers for these diseases and for aging and to detect a problem before it occurred. So what we do really want to do and what is the title of this talk is to now turn back this glycan clock to return it and to decrease the chance of developing these uh, diseases. And one of the things which we saw works was a caloric restriction. So this was a meta-analysis, this was a huge study, uh, 700, over 700 individuals uh, on a low calorie diet. So this was done across eight European states. And uh, they were on a diet for eight weeks. And basically people who had 8% or more of the weight reduction after eight weeks, uh, and they, one important thing, they started off uh, obese. So most of these people had a waist circumference of over 100 uh, centimeters, and uh, they, their BMI was very high. And basically, uh, after eight weeks, we could see significant changes in the glycans. Now, it did differ between some medical centers, potentially also because different European countries have uh, different cultures, different food, and so on. But in general, we again saw this trend of decreasing the pro-inflammatory glycans and increasing of the anti-inflammatory glycans upon this weight reduction and after uh, caloric restriction. Uh, we saw also in another study, so this was a study uh, where we looked at 37 individuals that underwent bariatric surgery and uh, they were classified to be um, uh, good candidates for bariatric surgery by NIH, so they were also very obese individuals. And what we saw is that even after the first short period, this was only three weeks of low calorie diet, we already saw some improvement uh, of the uh, profile of glycans. However, after six months and one year after the bariatric surgery, so basically when they experienced an extensive weight loss as a consequence of bariatric surgery, there was a drastic improvement in the anti-inflammatory glycans, uh, specifically glycans with two galactoses and a decrease in the pro-inflammatory glycans, the glycans without galactose. Another thing which is well known uh, as a lifestyle intervention that could uh, work to basically decrease the risk of the diseases is exercise. And in this study, we followed around 30 uh, young men, uh, otherwise fit men, and it's important to mention this, there are other cases which we could discuss later on in the questions if you want, uh, where this is not working. Uh, but basically in this uh, young, healthy, and otherwise fit individuals, intense exercise was by itself with a decent recovery period of around six weeks of exercise and four weeks of recovery was enough to change the profile of IgG glycosylation. Another inter interesting thing, potential intervention uh, that we're exploring is of course the change in the microbiome. So we did one study with fecal microbiota transplantation we did not see uh, after this period uh, significant changes on the IgG glycans themselves, but we did see a very significant change in the plasma glycum, which includes also other glycans within the blood uh, on other molecules, not only IgG. And we're actually now developing uh, another clock, a metabolic clock, uh, for which we have significant amount of data that it correlates to some other things, for instance, like diabetes and metabolic health. Um, and one more intervention that we're intensively working on and for which we believe it has a huge potential is HRT. And, um, 
I was actually interested in this when we talked about dogs because dogs don't actually experience menopause, if I'm right. But in women, in humans, we do have this phenomenon of menopause, which is not even happening that late. For majority, vast majority of women, this is happening in late 40s or early 50s. And menopause causes a huge shift of IgG glycosylation between this young to old uh, profile. And this is really something that we started noticing when the clients were coming in, that they were having a very, very good uh, glycan profile, and then all of a sudden a huge shift would occur within a time span of six months. And when we looked further into this, it was the menopause, which was the driver between this huge uh, shift. And we went further into exploring this and what is actually the causation you know, between this uh, shift in the menopause. And we saw that suppression of gonadal hormones in a placebo-controlled randomized trial actually identified a strong effects of estradiol. So, so basically in this group, um, the, the red group here, these were uh, women in which there was only a suppression of gonadal hormones and supplementation with placebo, but this blue group received estradiol. Uh, so this was artificial menopause in the red group and supplementation, in artificial supplementation in the blue group. And you can see that the red group actually experiences about 25% increase in biological age, whereas the blue group did not experience it. Now, after we stopped the suppression of gonadal hormones, the red group returned almost to the baseline. And this was a, a, a nice experiment showing that it is actually an effect of sex hormones, or in this case, specifically estradiol. So we wanted to explore this further. And uh, I'm showing here for the first time the results of a, a small study which we uh, did in UK. So this was done on 42 women uh, w which entered uh, menopause between the ages of 40 and 60. And we wanted to look uh, from before the point when they started doing the HRT and then follow them up for the next three and six months. And what we saw is that uh, all of the women that entered uh, the HRT treatment, so this was with bioidentical hormones, and this was primarily transdermal therapy, actually um, experienced a change in their biological age. And I'm saying a change. For the vast majority of women, so 38 out of 42, uh, so 40 out of 42, we saw a drastic decrease of the biological age. For two individuals, we actually saw a drastic increase of biological age, and this was a huge increase. This was the increase of like 16 or 20 years. Now, what we're extremely interested in now to follow up is are we actually in this group, you know, detecting uh, possible ways to use this biomarker in the optimization of HRT therapy. Uh, and we're exploring this further to see if we can actually optimize both the dose or uh, potential um, side effects of the HRT through using this as a biomarker. And this is something that we're now exploring further. And of course, the last question is how much can we actually turn this biological age clock? And we don't have the exact answer to this just yet, but we did do some models. Uh, we based it on the data that we already have and on the large twin study which followed uh, women for over 20 years. And the, our best models and best estimates say that most likely around 20% of what we see in the biological age, in the glycan biological age, is the effect of lifestyle. So this is something that most likely we can change through simple lifestyle changes. The rest of it is something that is both genetically predisposed, around 40% is a, an estimate of how much is genetically predisposed. And then another 40% is something that we called chronological age. But in effect, this is something that we're sharing in the environment where we live. So this could be epigenetics, so the, the epigenetics of the aging, this could be some shared environmental traits. We don't know exactly what is behind it. And with this, I'm finishing up my presentation. So thank you all for the attention. <laughs> <laughs>